Okay, project time. I've been shopping for phones, but that's not what's important right now. I'm gonna work on the projector, and I think I'm gonna make like a real rough video about this. This thing, okay, I bought this for $15. It is a Barco Reality 909 CRT projector, and it's been sitting in here for like a year now because I, I just, I haven't found time to work on it. But it's big, it takes up like half my workbench, and if nothing else, I want it to be somewhere else. So I'm gonna do some work and see if I can get it get it more functional. Let let me just show you what it does right now. So I got plugged in. Gonna turn on the power to it there. Uh okay. And let's turn on the power. Oh, look at that. Okay, so that seems like a dead short on the power supply, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open it up. I'm gonna remove all of the cards because a lot of the control for it is on these modular cards. Um, I'm probably gonna unplug the connectors up to the tubes. And then I'm gonna turn it on and see what happens. And hopefully, I'm hoping the short isn't on the like back plane or the main board. And that way I can kind of isolate where the problem is. And it would be nice if it's on one of the cards because they're easy to take out, which is just gonna make them a lot easier to work on. I'm kind of guessing that there's like a, a shorted capacitor or a shorted uh, transistor in there somewhere, and I've just got to find it and replace it. <clears throat> I will say too, some people, if you're a CRT projector head, I'm sorry I'm a little congested today, uh, you might look at this and say, Barco Reality 909, that has a service bulletin about a fault in the power. Yeah, I know. I already, when I first got this, it wouldn't even turn on, so... Like, at all. You'd push the button, just nothing happened. So, there's a service bulletin related to a low 5-volt standby power supply, that uh, low voltage on the 5-volt standby, that leads to these not turning on. I did what's in the service bulletin, which is replacing a couple of capacitors on the power supply board with different values. Now it does this. So, it seems like it got better. Now, did I introduce the short when I did that repair? Certainly not impossible, but I do, I've inspected it like a bunch of times. I feel pretty good that the the repair I did didn't introduce the short, but uh, we'll see. We'll see if I can narrow it down. Let me show you one thing, and I'm just going to turn off my uh, laptop sound so you stop hearing Discord. I'm going to show you one thing real quick that's kind of funny about this. This is the back of the projector. Inputs and connectors are, are down here. Um, there are, you can get boards that add different inputs so that's what that blank plate is about and this this projector is you know it's had better days so this doesn't there we go this is the control panel it's just it's the remote but it's like built in and i'll show you this isn't i was kind of hoping it would be infrared and there was like a receiver wouldn't that be funny no it's hardwired into the board so i just thought that was kind of a funny thing and opening it is kind of, I'll show it to you open, but it's kind of a pain, so I'm gonna, I'm not gonna try to record when I do that. Okay, so the top cover, there's a quarter turn latch in the front, and then it hinges that way at the back, but I don't have room on my workbench here for that to open, so the hinges have uh, pins that are on the top cover. If you pull the pins, then you can lift the whole thing right off. Now we can see that remote, and this is like the real cover, right? I think this is all pretty much done for RF shielding. Um, this is like, really, this is heavy built. And you could see this would all screw shut. I have a feeling this projector had problems, and that's why they stopped using it. Because when I got this, all of these screws were undone. Which, I don't know, kind of made me think that someone had been in here before trying to repair it. Um, oh, let me tell you where this came from, too, because that's mildly interesting. Uh... Oh, actually, that isn't the label I thought it was. That doesn't help that much. I'm sorry, this is a terrible visual experience, I know. Oh, I might have cleaned it. Oh, there it is. You can see that hinge pin I was talking about. So this came from the University of New Mexico. Um, I think I figured out... I believe this was manufactured in the mid-90s, but... Um, I don't remember for sure, so someone might correct me on that if they know these projectors. It's interesting that it is a Barco reality, not just a Barco, 
because as I understand it, Barco Reality was a division of Barco that made projectors for simulation systems, like flight simulators. So I don't know exactly. I'm kind of guessing this might have come out of like a visualization lab at UNM because uh, just visualization was, I don't know, it was a happening corner of computer science in, in the New Mexico University system for a while. Um, but maybe they had a flight simulator or something at the university for whatever reason. It might have come out of that. Let's take a look at the major parts. Lenses. This is a CRT projector, so there are three CRTs, one for red, green, and blue. Correspondingly, there are three lenses. These have adjustments. There's more adjustments here. These adjustments are for something which is called, does it say here? I believe it's Schampfloig or something like that. There we go. Schampflug. Uh, it's a German word, I guess. That's, uh, that has to do with the convergence of the lenses. So basically, if they're all lined up with each other, right? I don't know how to do any of those adjustments, but like this thing won't even turn on. So we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I have been warned um, when I did some research on this projector, because this is a Barco Reality 909, it is likely that it is designed for a spherical screen, which means I believe that the geometry of the lenses is a little different than a projector that was made for a flat screen. I think because this has these these nuts for adjustable Scheimpflug or whatever, I think that it's possible to adjust this projector to converge on a flat screen probably, but I'm not, I really don't know much about about that. That's just like a little bit that I, that I picked up. So once again, if I can get light to come out of the front, I will be happy getting it to actually focus on a screen. If there's electronics problems that can make it difficult to converge too, because I think it's analog timing internally. So like, you know, problems for later. This cover opens up and we get the CRTs. Okay, so you can see there's three tubes. One of the problems with these projectors is that the CRTs burn out over time. It, they don't really burn out. I think the phosphor kind of wears away and their lumen output drops. And replacement tubes, number one, are, I, I'm pretty sure not being made anymore. Number two, they're, they're expensive. Even used ones are, I think can be over $1,000 usually. So I let me tell you, I'm not, I really don't have a way to use this projector. I want to see our uh, CRT projector so much, which is why I bought this, but it's just so big. Um, I don't think I'm going to replace the tubes in it, but if I can get it to turn on, I, no matter what happens, I think I'm going to sell this. It's just, I would like to sell it after I get it working <laughs> and not just sell it for parts. Um, there, there are, I think, still kind of a community of people who really love these projectors and people might be interested in just buying the parts out of this. I don't really know. It's so heavy. It it's weighs, I think, 110 pounds is what the spec sheet says. Um, shipping it would cost quite a bit. I might end up ultimately giving this to someone for the price of shipping. Uh, I'm just not sure. Hey, if you want it, let me know. But man, I would love to see it working before I do that. So anyway, the tubes. I don't know if the tubes are good. We'll take that on um, if we can get it to turn on. I think replacing them is kind of a pain, too. I can kind of see... Yeah, like, they're not really connected to anything in the back. I think they're actually sort of glued on at the front, and so replacing them requires, like, cutting them out. I think it's a little bit of a complicated process, but problem for later. Um, I believe that is the high-voltage flyback power supply, so uh, it's spicy, I guess, is a way to describe that, because um, I think these get, like, kilovolt bias power. You can see some coils. I think those are like accelerator coils, but I'm not, don't, don't test me on my CRT theory. I don't know it that well. And then I believe the boards at the back are actually the, the, the like beam steering modulators, um, along with, the uh, the electron source. There's a lot of high voltage up here. So I don't, this has been off for a long time. Well, I guess admittedly, I just turned it on. Would that have charged the capacitors? I don't really know. I'm not going to touch anything right now out of caution. I also believe that these tubes emit some x-rays when they're operating, so it may not be a good idea to operate this with this cover open. I've kind of wondered if that's part of why there's two separate covers, but I, I don't, I'll just be cautious there. So, 
this cover. Wiring to the remote goes through there. I don't, maybe you can kind of see how it's, not really. But these are the modules I was talking about. So um, there's a website, uh, Kurt Palm, the Kurt Palm forums. Kurt Palm was like, I think he ran like a home theater integrator and kind of specialized in these projectors. And now his website has just kind of become the like headquarters for CRT projector enthusiasts. Um, I was able to get this like zip file with like thousands of pages of PDFs about this projector. There's service manuals, there's diagrams. So I feel like I have all the information I need to correct or to repair this. What I don't have is the scale. Like I just, serious electronics repair is not something that I've ever really done before. I feel like I've picked a bit up from YouTube videos, but, you know, I feel like I've picked a bit up from YouTube videos about flying helicopters. So we'll see how far that actually gets me. Um, I'm hoping it's just going to be like a basic thing where one of these boards has a dead short. I can find whatever component it is and swap it out. Uh, because of all those manuals, I figured out what all these boards were. I don't have the manual up right now. I wasn't that prepared, so I'm probably going to screw this up. But I think these are pretty much power supply stuff. I think this one is the main switch mode power supply. And I think this one is like a switch mode power supply for something else, maybe about running the tubes or something. I'm not 100% sure. But then these boards are processing. So I believe one of these is the vertical deflection card. One of them is the horizontal deflection card. So they generate the vertical and horizontal signals that go to the tubes to steer the beam and then I think one of them is just like a video processor. Um, this has a few different kinds of video inputs you can see. And I think that does all the just like analog conversion to drive the deflection cards from different video inputs. And then I believe one of them is the, the control card, basically. Uh, there's a, a board down there that they all plug into, but I think that's basically just backplane I think from the manual, I even figured out what those are. I think you can see there's an infrared receiver for an actual remote. I think that's actually like a power supply for the cooling fans or something like that. Um, what else is there that I can say right now? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, one of the cool things about these projectors, I'm not sure, but I think there's a good bet that this projector could do 1080 high definition at least at 30 frames a second. I don't know about 60, um, but it doesn't have an input for it. There are like RGBHV inputs that I could use some sort of converter with, but I think there's also like maybe a first party. I think there's at least an aftermarket card you can put in that gives you an HDMI input. You can see there's an empty slot there, which is for some sort of optional feature this doesn't have which I think would generally be more types of video inputs. Um, but yeah, that's where we're at. These cards, they kind of lever, if I can figure out the right way to do this. There we go. They kind of lever out for service. And I'm actually going to have to leave that one in because, well, I'm just going to pull everything. I'm going to push the button and I'm going to see what happens, which I believe will be nothing because this is the main power supply. But we'll go from there. Speaking of service bulletin, this is the card with the service bulletin, but that I did not do. So someone has already been in here and done some repairs. Okay, projector vlog update. I am making a mess. I removed all of the modules. So this is the switch mode power supply which you can see is kind of mechanically complicated. It's got these like flip out sections and stuff. Um, this, I'm not actually sure what this board is called. I believe that area that doesn't pop out is power factor correction. A little fuzzy on this. Uh, I got to look at the manual because it explains what all these are. Um, this, I think, is like a deflection power supply, and then these are all like video processing and generating the actual deflection signals. You can see there's a big old FPGA on that, which is kind of neat. I think this is like RGB converts all video sources to RGB, 
and then these are horizontal and vertical deflection. These have a bunch of cables between them, which is a little annoying for slide out cards. But so what was I doing? I turned this on with nothing in it and nothing happened because the switchman power supply was out. What did you expect? I just, I had to try it, right? So then I put just the switch mode power supply module in, turned it on, same thing, rapidly cycling on and off. So I think there's still a short. Um, where did I go next? So in the service manual, let me pull this up. In the service manual, I have diagrams that give the, uh, the pinout on these connectors. So I checked all of the outputs of the power supply with these little, little pin connector, not really intended as probes, but that's what I'm using them for. Uh, and I didn't find anything that looked suspicious to me. Um, I think there was like 20,000 ohms, 20 kilo ohm or more on every output. So none of that feels like dead short to me. So I've kind of suspected that the problem is in the switch mode power supply because you can tell someone's worked on it before. I repaired it and I don't know what I'm doing. So who knows if I did a good job. Uh, and I think this is kind of reconfirming. I don't see, I would love to strip this down more so that there's like nothing but the back plane. I had popped open the tube cover. Sorry, I'm making I make a huge mess when I'm working on things. Uh, and I was thinking about starting to unplug all of the the tube like driver boards. But then I, I didn't I don't know if I had noticed this before. See, there's those big like multi pin connectors at the bottom. Um, this bottom board continues under the metal shield here. You can kind of see through the hole. And I'm not even sure how to get that out. I think that has to come out from the bottom. And this thing is so heavy, I need my husband's help to get it, to even pick it up, really. So I don't want to take that out. That seems like a big hassle. But the fact that I don't find anything near a dead short on any of the... These have, like, washers on them. They get... There we go. It doesn't want to close. Um, the fact that I can't find anything that looks like a dead short on any of the outputs of this board make me think the short is more likely on this board. So, and there's a bunch of like power switching MOSFETs on this. I think they're the kind of thing that, that would seem like a likely source of trouble. So I am going to put back in the other modules just to clear up my workspace. Then I think I'm going to start probing for shorts. I have a whole circuit diagram for the power supply. I mean, that's like what's in the manual here. I am, I think not, I don't think I know what I'm doing well enough to like interpret that circuit diagram that well, or, or to like use it to figure out what I should be testing. So I think I'm going to just kind of poke around, see if I can find any shorts on the output sides on this. And that Maybe then I can trace those through the wiring diagram, and it'll give me an idea of what components are possible culprits. That's the plan. I'm learning this as I go. Okay, so this is embarrassing. I So I did the service bulletin to the power supply, like, three or four months ago. And then it did this thing where it was cycling when I turned it on, and I haven't really worked on it since. And so, like I told you, I pulled everything out. I was doing all this resistance checks. I pulled this board out, just the, the switch mode power supply module, and I was looking all over it. I was checking the resistance across all the output pins, like maybe I can find a short. Everything looks fine. And then I look in there, into the middle, and there's one of these, you know, this kind of cable. Not that one, but there's a yellow, bunch of little yellow wires with a connector. It's just hanging in there, not hooked up to anything. And I said to myself, I wonder if that's important. So I flipped out the little daughter board where I had done the repair and looked at the bottom. And sure enough, there was the connector with nothing plugged into it. Hooked those wires up, put it back together, put it back in. And now look at this. Solid red light. We're in standby, baby. So I think the whole time 
after I did that power supply repair, the only problem is that I forgot to hook one of the connectors back up. Ah, uh, that's why you should just look at everything carefully before you put too much effort into anything else. Okay, so I gotta stop that or I'll get in trouble with YouTube. Let's turn on the power switch. Uh, let's, let's actually turn it on. I just turned it off. Okay, we got a red light, which means we're in standby. That's good. I just closed the top cover up. I actually found in the service manual, there's kind of a neat thing. There's a jumper in there on the power supply. You can uh, put in that totally disables standby mode, so it just turns on when it gets external power. It's kind of nice that they gave you that option, but this one isn't set up that way, so it turns off. Um, so here's the thing. I'm going to push the button on the remote. Try to turn it on. Let's see how wrong this goes. Nothing. Nothing at all. Okay. Yeah, I think it's refusing to leave standby. So, I like this, though. This puts our problem in a more a more normal place, right? This is less like it's shorted and more like something just doesn't work, which I feel more equipped to contend with. Um, I'm trying to think of what I should do next. We're in standby. Standby power clearly works. Pushing the remote button isn't doing anything. One wonders, does this remote work? Should something light up on it? I don't really know. I just want to, let's open this cover again and look at the lights. There's, uh, there's like diagnostic lights. You can see the red one, obviously, that says we're in standby, but I'm looking, this board has a bunch of LEDs on it and they're just all off. There's like one LED for every power rail on that. This, I need to look in the manual and find out what this board is, because it's got something to tell us hold down on long off equals short smps on off i probably need to look at that i should also just check just the dumb stuff right like i should just make sure that this is hooked up right that looks good on that end i'll check the other end of where this goes see if i can think of other things i'm trying to remember is this how it behaved before i did the power supply service bulletin. It may be that I didn't do anything by doing that repair, repair in air quotes. Um, now I checked the capacitor values that were there were not the ones that the service bulletin said to install. So the service bulletin hadn't been done on this projector. So I guess it's good that I did it because projector won't turn on is one of the, you know, one of the symptoms that the service bulletin was to address. So if nothing else, I have eliminated a problem, but I think I'm actually back at where I started, which is a little depressing, but I feel like that's better than where I was before I found that unplugged cable. Okay, I'm going to start looking closely at things some more, see if I can figure out where the cable goes. I might actually try setting that jumper to disable standby. Maybe that'll get us somewhere. Um, we'll see. Okay, so we're going to continue a theme of my attempting complex diagnostics for stupid problems. When I was messing with it earlier, once I got it to go into standby, I was kind of looking, that looks like an LED, right? Shouldn't that like do something? It's off right now, but shouldn't that do something when I push the button? So I started reading through the manual, like, I, you know, maybe I can, and sure enough, the user manual says when you push a button, that green light should blink. So I was like, well, maybe the 9-volt standby power actually doesn't work, and that's probably what powers the remote. So I, was, I decided to pull out the remote and test the, you know, see if I could figure out the power going to it. I don't know if you can see the connector in the hole there that actually hooks, you know, connects to the remote. I call it the remote, even though it's the one that's screwed to it. Um, and sure enough, with the meter, it looked like there was 9 volts going to the remote. So then I put the connector back on and I was like, well, I don't really know what else to try. And I was just kind of fiddling around and I noticed, wait a minute, the remote's backlit. That didn't happen before. 
I think, here's the thing. I think that connector to the remote, when I unscrewed the remote, it just fell out. And that connector is tight. Like, I have to use a tool to pry it off. I don't think that connector was on all the way. <laughs> I think the remote just wasn't hooked up. So uh, I don't know if you're ready for like a big reveal here. Let me let me dim the lights for more effect. I'm gonna push the button. Wait for it. Wait. Wait. I swear. I swear. You just help. Oh. Uh huh. Oh, look at that. So I, something I'm not happy with, which is that it should be displaying its warm-up pattern right now. And you, you can't tell because it's way too close to the wall to be focused. But that should be white. So I'm, I'm worried that the blue tube isn't on. I mean, we saw it emit white for a minute, right? So conceptually it can work. But I am a little worried that the blue tube isn't on right now. I'm wondering if... Uh, if there's a problem with the video signal to it or, or something, uh, I don't know. I got to think about it, but let me tell you, this is some real progress on the projector. I'm going to call this, I'm going to call this first light. Okay. I don't, I don't know why I'm always pointing the camera away, but I don't, I don't really have anything to show you right now. I'll just tell you, I, uh, thought I should mess around a little more because I was worried about the blue tube potentially not working. Uh, you can, the software for that, like you can configure a lot on this projector. The manual goes on for just pages and pages and pages with menu trees. And the warm up period, you might remember this with older projectors. Normally when you turn it on, it would show a message that says like projector is warming up, please wait with the countdown. But that's configurable. You can change the time period and you can change whether it happens at all. I think that must just be turned off on this projector because the blue tube actually seems to work fine. If I hit the menu button on the remote, then the blue tube comes on as well. I don't know what it's trying to do that is whatever the combination of red and green gets you. I, I failed primary school on the color front, apparently. Um... So I'm going to read the manual because I don't, I mean, I'm pretty sure that the, you rotate the lenses for focusing, but I don't totally know how to focus it. I don't know if I'll be able to get it to focus in this room because this was made for a really long throw, but I'm hoping if I adjust the lenses to the closest focus they'll go and then slide it to the back of the workbench, I'll be able to get something on the wall where I can at least like see the menu. Um... And that that's my plan. But I, like, this thing works. I, I'll throw in a little video with all three tubes on so you can see. But it does work. I have no idea if the image will be at all usable. Like, there are a million adjustments for the image. There's all kinds of, like, there's focus across the field. Not just, like, the lens focus, but, like, getting the left side and the right side to both be in focus. There's adjustments for whether or not the, the horizontal and vertical lines are straight. I mean, you remember CRT projectors, or you remember CRT monitors and all the geometry adjustments. Well, this thing is a CRT projector, so it's got those same adjustments, but it's got them times three, one set for each tube, and then it's got extra stuff. Because this was made for simulation use, it's got, it's got something called north-south and east-west adjustment that's like specific to simulation applications. The, the manual says only the simulation models have it. I don't even know what those do. I think it might be something about when it's on a spherical screen and it's not at the correct center point. Um, I also, I'm not totally sure, but I think this projector has the module installed for using multiple projectors in a grid and doing like a soft roll off on the edges so you can get them to not look you know like they're overlapping so much at the edge so potentially it's going to take a lot of adjustment to get like a usable image out of this thing um reading the service manual there's even like jumpers you might have to move on the rgb driver board depending on 
the like front and back porch sizes of your input signal, uh, it could be a complex thing. So I, I need some sort of video source to use with this. It takes, I gotta think about that. It's got S-Video on it. I might actually bring the LaserDisc player in here because I, that's just one of the like better quality sources that I have for standard definition video and try driving it with that. I'm hoping that in, in its previous life, it was just kind of configured in a pretty normal way. I think it's as configurable as it is because these were used with like in simulation applications with like weird video sources, right? With like funky video output adapters for computers and that sort of thing. So I think that's why it's got a, a million and one different options. But that's where we're at. This thing works. And it is very funny to me that as far as I can tell, all that was actually wrong with it, the one cable that was disconnected, I'm 99% sure that's my fault because I had to disconnect that to take the power supply apart to do the service bulletin. So it's possible that when I took this home from the auction yard, the only thing that was wrong with it was the cable to the built-in remote control being loose, which is pretty funny given that I have literally had this for a year and just been like, well, it's not working. It's going to be some big project to get it to where it'll even turn on. Um, yeah, wish me luck. If I can get any kind of like recognizable image out of it, then I'll throw that on here. Otherwise, I'll just show you all three tubes on um, so that you can enjoy that beautiful, beautiful sight. So here's a personal story, and I'm employing here the powerful technology of leading my phone against my multimeter, so it won't be shaking the whole time for me holding it. I, I've had the Alan Varsons project on while I was working on this today and that's that's just like I don't know it's just what was like <laughs> open in, in my music player when I uh turned on my laptop but I was thinking about that a bit because you know Alan Parsons was the producer on Dark Side of the Moon it's like one of the kind of one of the things he's best known for I honestly I like the Alan Parsons project more than I like Pink Floyd but you know I'm sure people will argue with me about that we could have a whole pitchfork article about it but I was thinking about that in relation to CRT projectors, because I, ever since I was a little kid, I've been fascinated by CRT projectors. And that's why I've always, like, wanted to have one. I know everyone who does, like, YouTube videos about old technology, that's always their story. Is like, I saw one of these when I was a little kid, and I got obsessed with it, and, and now, now that they're kind of old junk and no one wants them, I can get one for cheap. And that's my relationship with CRT projectors. But very specifically, I remember going to, what was at the time called the Murdoch Planetarium at OMSI, at the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, because I grew up in Portland. And when I was a kid, the Murdoch Planetarium had, I couldn't tell you what model, it was some sort of Zeiss planetarium projector, like one of the big, like, dog bone shaped mechanical ones in a pit in the middle of the room, which I was obsessed with as a kid. Believe me, if I could get one of those at auction, it would be in this office right now, and my husband would really be telling me I have to get it out of the house. But uh, hard to come by those. There's a guy in, like, Southern California somewhere who collects them. He has, like, a, like a sheet metal outbuilding behind his house with, like, ten different mechanical planetarium projectors. I think, you know, he'll, he'll give you a tour if you contact him. One day I'm gonna go out and do that. Anyway, the Murdoch Planetarium had a mechanical projector, but in the pit around the mechanical projector were probably three or four CRT projectors. And then it had a dome screen, and around the outer ring were laser projectors and, and more CRT projectors. Maybe another four CRT projectors. Could have been six. And... I think those would have been models very much like this one from the simulation division because they were all converged so that they could do full video across the dome. Um, at least I, I think that was the case because I think I remember them doing like, like, like video, not the mechanical projector, but proper video on the dome back in that era. So probably pretty similar models because these were 
these were made for spherical screens like that. And I very specifically remember that the planetarium did a Pink Floyd laser show in the evenings. I've talked to people before who also remember this. There must have been some, like, company that put together that laser show and then sold it to planetariums, because it seems like a bunch of, like, regional science museum planetariums had this Pink Floyd laser show, and I never saw it as a kid. I always wanted to. I don't, I don't really know why I didn't. There were so many things as a kid that I'm like, I don't know why I never, if I just, like, made a stink, my parents probably would have taken me, right? But I never did. Um, so I don't know, just something about the mystique of like the Pink Floyd laser show and these CRT projectors in there. It's really lodged in my head. I remember sitting in that planetarium for the planetarium shows and seeing, um, the, the, the red, green, blue glow of the lenses of those CRT projectors in the pit. Because a lot of these projectors, they don't, the CRT projectors, the tubes have to stay warm. It takes like a while for them to warm up to get to full brightness. Um, and I haven't let this stay on long enough for that to happen. So I don't really know how bright this will get. Uh, but then you have to keep them warm. So it's kind of like some like theatrical light dimmers have like a wedding voltage that they always apply. It's sort of like that. These projectors, when there's like no, when the input is all black, they still like drive the tubes at a low power to keep them warm during the show. And I remember seeing that. So this wasn't really going anywhere. That's just a little personal connection I have between CRT projectors, uh, Pink Floyd, the Alan Parsons Project, who I saw live in Albuquerque at the Kiva Auditorium like two years ago. And I am hoping that Alan Parsons lives long enough that they come back. Uh, that's, <laughs> uh, pitch in with me on that dream. I would love to see them a second time. Anyway, I'm going to start trying to see if I can get this thing to focus and, uh, get an actual image out of it, which will probably just be the menu, but I think that'll be my achievement for the day. I've kind of been working on this thing, like, all day at this point, but it's better than working on a mail server all day, which is what I did yesterday. Okay, so I slid it further back on the workbench, and I set the lenses as close as they'll go. Obviously, that is still not far enough for it to focus. Um, if I hit that, okay. So, I'm sorry, the flicker's real bad. I got a, I'm just using my phone right now, so I don't know that I have a good way to, maybe if I turn up the lights, actually, the exposure will get, nope, that didn't really help. I'm going to have to figure out a better way to uh, show you the output of this thing. But you can see that it's not, it is not converged in the least. Um, so there's two things going on. Number one, it's just too close to focus. Number two, because there's three separate lenses, they're, um, they're aimed angle-wise to converge at a certain distance. And it's, it's too close. So I think if I get this pointed at something further away, it I really doubt the convergence will be good because this has been like, I don't know how long it's been since this thing was last turned on, right? I believe, did I say this? I think it was manufactured in the mid 90s, but I imagine it's been sitting in a storage closet for a long time before I bought it at auction and that was already a year ago. So, but it should get better than this. But here it is, it's working. I've got to figure out now how to get it um, pointed at something further. I might have to move it to the living room, which is gonna be a big hassle because it's very heavy. In particular, it's very front heavy and there isn't really any good way to lift it. So I'm actually, it's funny, it's got wood on the bottom that I think was used to ceiling mount it maybe at some point. Although when it showed a Barco logo, it looked like it was right side up. So I think maybe it was most recently on a tick. Anyway, the point is, I think I'm going to, like, figure out a way to mount some handles to it so it's easier to move. One of the tricks is that the center of gravity, because of the lenses, is very far forward. The manual gives a diagram, but the center of gravity is, like, almost to the front of the main case, which is just, like, a big thing that makes it difficult, you know, even for two people to carry, because, like, you can't really hold it from the side very well. If you hold it from the front, then that person has the whole weight of it. It's frustrating to move, but I'm going to figure something out. 
Let me show you, though, what was the real source of my enchantment as a kid. Isn't that just beautiful? Like, man, modern projectors. Uh, obviously, they're they're brighter and smaller and cheaper and, and everything else than this thing. But they just, they don't quite look like that, do they? Okay, I might stop working on this for the day because Sam is here and it is time for his wet food and he hasn't gotten it yet and he is getting a little bit agitated about it. 